Good afternoon, everybody. This is Janelle Pecano with the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, here for the technical assistance on the Health Home application. Also joining me today is Rob Nugin. Um, Asset could not be with us for today's uh, presentation, to let you know. But uh, as the format, as before, we are going to review questions that have been submitted during the week. And then if people want to submit any questions during the webinar, you have on your control panel, you have an um, audience question box. You can type your question in there and then hit send, and we'll be able to read the question here and uh, hopefully give you an answer to that question. Um, we haven't had people that have wanted to ask their questions orally. That opportunity is there, but you need to be connected um, either with a speaker or headsets or you have a microphone on your computer or you've uh, accessed this um, webinar by dialing in over the telephone. Uh, so usually when for all those things to come together, I think people usually find it easier to just send the question in writing. So we're going to start with the first question, and that is um, if we have an agency that's pre-enrolling uh, a pre-existing client in health home service, does the agency need to complete a new comprehensive assessment if all the assessment areas were covered in a previous mental health assessment, or can the agency do an update? And there's also a question on can the agency use the same form as its current assessment? And so let me switch over. Next slide, and hopefully everybody received the uh, PowerPoints. Uh, I emailed them out about 10, 15 minutes ago, so I apologize again uh, for the delay in that. We're just trying to get it as current as possible. So that's the section. What I what I put here in this slide is the rule that has was filed last Tuesday um, with JCAR and the language and the time frame. So that section describes what has to be in the comprehensive assessment. And it has to be the person's physical health, behavioral health, long-term care, and social service needs. And then it goes on to describe where the information can come from. It's incorporating medical tests, consumer, family, guardian, um, health home team members, other sources as applicable. So let me go back. Okay, again, to the slide, the question there. So if you have to complete a new comprehensive assessment, you, um, and I'll go with the second one first, can you use the same form? The department does not um, prescribe that providers use a certain form. We've recommended, encouraged providers to actually integrate uh, the forms needed for health home service with other forms from the organization, integrated care plan, assessment. So. Certainly, as long as it uh, meets the needs of the provider in doing an assessment that uh, was required by the Health Home Service Rule, absolutely can utilize the same form. Other, um, if a provider already has that in place, that's great. There are providers that have been uh, providing integrated care uh, prior, you know, they've been doing that for a while, and they already have all of these elements in place. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And if the assessment, um, if you feel that your previous assessment was um, already covers it, then what you would want to do is do an update. You need to review the information, make sure everything is there and everything is current um, at the time of enrollment or um, as required within the 30 days. And excuse me, I've got little technical difficulties, so I'm going to get my panel back up here. That uh, didn't work very well. Okay. So, yeah, sorry. So, if if the assessment's already in place, you would want to review it. For example, if the person was uh, receiving health home service, uh, or that's going to receive health home service, that maybe your original uh, diagnostic or mental health assessment was done. 10 months ago, 
when the provider, and they've come in, they've been receiving other services, counseling, mental health assessment, farm management, CPST, for example. So when you're switching over um, and starting to provide health home service, review what's in place, document the review, and update any, section, any sessions, sections sorry, as necessary. I have a question. Does enrollment in the health home service impact participation in AOD case management? And the answer to that is no. And here I have uh, in the rule, again, this is the rule that was filed. It's a proposed rule that we filed with uh, JCAR last Tuesday, a new section, a new paragraph about informed consent. And part of that we talk about that making sure the enrollee knows about uh, the relationship between health home service and other services. And give the example of CPST, as providers are aware, in the Ohio Medicaid um, billing rule, that if a person is enrolled in health home service, that um, you cannot bill that provider or any other provider is not permitted to bill CPST. And that's what the section on the ODMH rules to make sure that uh, consumers know that, that so that they can make informed decisions about participating uh, in health home service. But it does not include AOD. And as a matter of fact, we made a little fine tuning. Uh, Doug Day, who is our chief of uh, health integration for the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, had to sort of fine tune this before we filed it to make sure that it was clear and people didn't uh, misunderstand and think you could not receive um, AOD case management service. I received a question about uh, joint commission accreditation that might be required under the health home rule. And in this particular example, the, the agency, when the joint commission did their survey, they applied the phys primary physical health care standards during their accreditation survey. And they asked whether they had to receive health home. And the answer to that is no. And here I have the section of the rule as it relates to uh, in B down there at the bottom, uh, as it relates to joint commission accreditation. It's either the primary physical health care accreditation and, or it is a primary care medical home certification by the Joint Commission. The certification, um, according to Joint Commission standards, is optional. If an organization is providing primary physical health care, the Joint Commission will review the standards under the accreditation. But and that's just for the primary physical health care standards, not the primary care medical home certification. Uh, I have a question here about um, health home service population. And then I've got uh, following it, the next two slides is, uh, comprises the answer. And one of the bullet points asks about the characteristics of the population service usage medical conditions. And the question was, since the department is identifying who is eligible, and that's the list of the de-identified data uh, that people um, can download from the department's website, do we, does, does the provider still have to do that? And the answer is yes. And there I also have had on the slide, the screen went blank again. Um, back up. OK, looks like it's back up to back up for me and back up for everybody. That there at the bottom of the slide is that section of the uh, application on page two to which this is referencing. Okay. And yes, the, the, the answer to that is yes. What the, what the purpose here is for an organization to demonstrate their knowledge of health home service, the population. So you're going to start with downloading, um, getting the information from the department's website, and I'll show how to do that, and identify the population your agency will be serving. We're, we're um, Ohio Medicaid and um, Ohio MHA have worked together to make that file available. And giving an example, your agency, it might lead toward adult SPMI population with significant medical history of cardiac issues, or you might have a youth population. 
there may be, um, you're not going to have, you know, logistically, you're not going to have any one single physical health care category uh, in your population data, but evaluate it. See how it leans. See um, what the types of uh, persons that you would expect to have in the service are. So review it. Review that data. And then that can help you also establish separate health home teams if necessary. You may have, um, you know, as an organization, based upon your numbers of consumers that you expect to participate in health home service, you may have one team, but you have, may have multiple teams. Um, within that multiple teams, if you have three, you might have one sort of generalist team, and you may have one that is specific to, you know, the previous example, adult STMI with cardiac issues. So the, um, the department's going to look at that and through the application, and not just the answer here, but the application in its entirety sort of helps uh, give the picture of the, um, your agency's understanding of health home, the concepts, and the building and the implementation of it. When you put together your health home team and what are the specialties on your team, you might have your embedded primary care clinician, if you are a youth-serving um, organization, you have a youth-serving team, you might have a uh, pediatrician um, on your team. You might have, if you have a team, a uh, health home team for uh, women and certain women's issues, you might have somebody with that expertise. So it's not just getting a list of the people and what are their physical health care needs in addition to their behavioral health, but it's taking that information, designing your health home service, and setting it up to meet your population needs. And let me see, I might have, let me see if I skipped over it, and sorry, I am having All right, that, that's all of the, the questions that were received. I, we um, will do more TA sessions, and I do have written questions. I have to go back and retrieve those. But I want to try taking a poll here, and I'm going to launch that poll. And to get a little information, we're asking about how often people think we should continue these TA sessions. We've been doing them weekly for the past, I think, this is the fifth or the sixth one. Um, as I put there, we have scheduled one for next week, and that registration information is there. We'll hold that. But whether providers feel like this is helpful to have it every week, um, every other week, perhaps once a month. If we go once a month, that might be after next week, perhaps the middle of August in the middle of um, September, um, or if people think there's no need to continue. We're, you know, we're happy to do this and have this available uh, for providers. I know very early on in some of the sessions we were having some technical difficulties with, uh, primarily with audio at the time. All right, so. All right. It looks like people have had a chance to answer that, so I'm going to go ahead um, and close that. Well, getting ready to close the poll. What I will have put out this week is information about how to register um, for other sessions, and in addition, we'll make the one for next week um, available to people who um, aren't on the um, participating right now in the TA. This is the first time I've uh, put this out. Thank you for that. It looks like uh, oh, half the people want it every other week, uh, a third weekly, and then a couple people with not needing to continue, and just a couple people with one a month. So I'll look at those overall results, and we'll uh, make that just um, see what uh, meets the needs of providers. Okay, first question that we received in writing, and again, feel free to uh, just, if you have something, just put it, type it in there, and then hit send. Is there a single location to get all of the uh, various application TA PowerPoints? 
Well, right now there is not, but I will work to get those up on the website. Um, in addition, we've had some difficulty since the launch of the department's um, new website getting the PowerPoint that accompanied the original two-hour application training on June 14th. So we're still trying to get that reestablished. So make a note of that. Uh, next question from Pam is, can we discuss the crisis management contingency plan in more detail regarding what we expect? Pull up the file drawer here. And while that's coming up, um, on the crisis management and contingency plan, you're going to, and in the same way with a person who received um, on the mental health side, if you have a, an individual who has um, a, perhaps a significant history of suicidal, suicide attempts, um, serious um, ideation you know, to the extent of having a plan and access to the plan, and mental health we're pretty familiar with doing some types, doing as a risk assessment and working with the consumer to develop some type of crisis management plan. And this is on the health home side, it's, it's the same way. It's going to look different for your different, um, different uh, consumers receiving the service and they're up on the screen there, I've got that section of the rule under the, the plan. So if you have a consumer for example, who um, you've been working with in the health home service, and they're pretty, um, they're pretty good. They're pretty good at um, following the plan that's put together on the physical health side, the behavioral health side. They're they're working real hard to uh, um, you know manage their weight and check their diabetes and eat appropriately. That plan might look very different than somebody who isn't. Um, isn't as likely uh, to do that and still struggling. The plan can be, you know, identifying if you check your sugar, you check your check your blood um, glucose level. It's letting the consumer know. Well, if your results are within in, within this range, you need to perhaps contact your primary care physician. If you have somebody with some cardiac issues and maybe they've been prescribed nitro tablets, making sure that, you know, as part of the plan that if they experience certain symptoms that maybe they take one of those tablets. If that doesn't allevi alleviate it, when might they want to present, uh, call a primary care physician? When might the individual want to present to the emergency room? One of the goals of Health Home Service is to eliminate unnecessary emergency room visits and hospitalization. So this can be a way of helping the consumer kind of know when is it appropriate to contact the, uh, apologize for that noise, uh, just uh, drop some, some books here. That might let the consumer know when it's appropriate to contact, uh, go to an emergency room, and when it's appropriate to contact their primary care physician or contact a member of the health home team. Next question is, uh, was your request to show people how to get the de-identified data for agency um, consumers? So let me go over to um, the department's website. I'll go to the front page. Under regulation on the front page, you have a drop-down menu of uh, certification and licensure. And go over to application. And under applications, under certification and deemed status, there is a bullet point down here that says health home de-identified data. The file was created June 28th. If you click on that, it's going to take you to the Ohio Medicaid Health Home site. Um, this has, even though it's taking you to different different location. This has been the easiest way to get there. And there on the bottom you have the health home de-identified data on that file. Okay. 
Next question. The information states that individuals with Medicaid spend down can participate in Health Home when the spend down is met. Does this mean that we can bill CPST until the spend down is met? Uh, the purpose of you know, today we talk about the standards um, as it relates to the Health Home Service Rule and the application. Don't really I, you know, answer specific questions about billing. They are setting up additional webinars to discuss that because um, that is that's a billing question related to um, Ohio Medicaid um, an Ohio Medicaid rule. But you know if um, you know because if you have, for example, if you just have a complete non-Medicaid um, health home service, non-Medicaid client that the board is funding. At this point, I'm not aware of the board doing any non-Medicaid funding, but that that possibility is there. Individual just um, they need to be looking at what are the requirements in the ODMH AS rule, um, and the billing is related to Medicaid. So I'm going to defer that question to the, another webinar that um, uh, the Office of Health Integration is going to hold. Is the final copy of the rules you filed with JCAR on our website? Uh, it is. You can, or you can get to it if you go back again to regulation, and you go down to rules. I've got to move one of my things here. You go to pending rules, and that's going to take you to the Register of Ohio, all of our pending rules, and then you can click there on uh, the 5122-29, it'll give you the public notice. Our public hearing is Friday, August 16th at 10 o'clock. There's a RSFA, which is the Rule Summary Fiscal Analysis, that we're required to fill out the rule and other documents. There's a question about we can't review the state data unless um, we're provided names. Can we give us the names of the people on our list? And again, that, that's a question to um, either uh, send to, I'm sorry, to ask during a health integration webinar, or if you want to email that uh, question to the health home. Uh, there's a, I want to say there's a health home email box. It really hasn't. Um, or email um, in the same way that we have like incidents or rules email address. I know that there's been problems and it hasn't been working. So if you send it to Rob Nugent, um, Rob's here, and, and you've, Rob's email address is here on the last slide. He's been forwarding those to the Office of Health Integration. Several people, when they've been trying to submit it, have gotten bounced back. Question, is there deemed status for health home service, that is, if the agency is already accredited under Joint Commission primary physical health care standards, must the agency go through this application process? And the answer is no, there is not deemed status for health home service, and yes, the agency has to go through the application process. Uh, even with the recent change in deemed status, health home service was not a covered service under deemed status. And working with CMS, and getting approval for the service as a new service, it was felt that uh, the department needed to make um, to not include it in deemed status. We will look at that again um, in the future. Uh, but we were, in order to get CMS approval, we needed to maintain um, or not have it covered under deemed status. How late can a provider turn in the application and be approved to start on October 1st? There is, um, you know, there is no deadline to turn it in. We've, um, as we talked about it last week, we had asked providers, uh, if possible, to have it in by August 1st. But we also recognized that the de-identified data uh, wasn't uh, wasn't made available until earlier this month, and that has impacted. Uh, providers' ability to turn in their um, applications, and, and that's actually that's a good thing because it goes back to an earlier question where you, um, as part of developing your health home service, you review that data and use that to help um, 
um, really trying not to do that. Use that data to help um, define and develop your health home service. There's parts of it that you know you could put in place before, and there was other information that was dependent upon that. So that said, um, we are committed to doing our best in the office to process all of the applications as timely as possible. When an application comes in, and this is the same for an application for health home or any other service, it's reviewed by staff to see is it complete and is it compliant. A, the date that an application is complete and compliant is the effective date of certification caveat being um, we're not planning to certify people prior to October 1st um, for the health home service unless they're in a phase one county or there's there's another need to do so. We don't want to um, confuse the issue. So uh, that said, Lee, if, you know, if we get an application on September the uh, Friday, I think September 27th, if we um, review it, a week later the surveyor gets to it, uh, the following Friday everything's complete and everything's compliant, we will make the effective date of certification October 1st. That said, um, your date of certification can be different than your effective date of Medicaid billing. Okay. It doesn't mean that it will be different, it means that it can be different. Here's a question on were the contracts with the National Council extended? And I believe, Rob, you, you took that question earlier from two or three weeks ago from somebody and, and talked Correct. to Health Integration. Correct. Health Integration said that, that uh, the plan was to extend that contract and that they would be, somebody would be releasing information about TA events that they would be um, uh, sponsoring. So. Uh, I think at this point it's still um, it's still in process, and uh, as I understand, they should have something uh, by I think she said the middle of August around that time, uh, getting some information out about upcoming TA events. Thank you. Uh, another question about getting access to identified client information for our agency that is. Um, at some point, the department is developing uh, the business associate agreement, and they will make that um, available uh, on the website when, it, when, it's, when it's developed. And there's, that process is separate than the health home application process. So the identified data, you would want to submit that question either during a webinar when they set up the next webinar out of the Office of Health um, Integration. Or as I said, if you want to email any questions to Rob Nugent, he'll forward them on. Um, and that's um, always happy to do that at any time. As we've just mentioned that the um, email, they've had trouble getting the email box reestablished for health time questions. What well, question is, what will happen if an agency submits an application August 1st and the rules being proposed are changed? How would an agency handle this? Okay. And uh, Paula, on, on your question there, I don't know. Um, the application is based upon the proposed rule. So the one that was filed last Tuesday is what um, the application is based upon. So we don't need to wait for that rule to get through the process and then update the application. We were trying to be forward thinking in that regard. And then we had shared that information. Um, at the provider, uh, the full-length provider application TA on June 14th, as well as um, um, now. So if, if that if that doesn't answer your question, then feel free to type in a follow-up. Other, there's a question um, about that. The identified data. What do um, what does the department expect providers to do with that? So I'm going to go back to uh, the slides where it's identifying the population your agency is going to be serving. Um, 
you utilize that to help further define and develop your health home service. You can use that to determine whether you need to establish separate health home teams. You can utilize that for policies. You can utilize that information for your staff training. You can utilize that information for uh, the skill sets of persons that comprise your health home team. Um, question, what do you mean that the date of certification may differ from the date of um, Medicaid? When an agency is certified, um, that demonstrates their, obviously that demonstrates their um, compliance and readiness to provide the service. Then uh, as part of the process of being able to build Medicaid, you work with the Office of Health Integration. Teresa Rorba is often the point of contact there uh, to set up uh, the Medicaid, and she's sort of the point of contact between certification and also with Ohio Medicaid. So it could be the same date. It, uh, it could be a later date. Um, it, uh, is dependent upon, well, I really don't, I, I don't even want to give a general answer to that because uh, I don't, I don't want to give a wrong, wrong answer. But the expectation, and, it, and it's May, so people, providers shouldn't get uh, concerned about it. And, you know, if a provider if, is, you know, certified and we notify you of your certification October 1st. You should be looking at um, getting things um, taken care of on the Medicaid side at that time. Or, uh, and, and that's why we're trying to do these technical assistance, help providers get the applications, get the applications in here so we can review them and be timely. Uh, question, reading through the questions, when will the webinar about the quality measures be held? I don't, um, I don't have that information myself and um, it will be, it, if it, uh, and I have to admit I'm behind in, a couple days behind in some, looking at some of my emails. I'm not aware of it being sent out yet, but it will be, really, it will be sent out. Usually there's a Medico, Medicaid health home highlights for the Ohio MHA um, newsletters that get sent out by Eric Wonderspling. There's, a, there's uh, some more questions about the population data and the information on you know, what we're going to be looking at to see if we've evaluated the data, all that we have is a total number. If you're having um, some difficulty in sort of getting through the, the data that's provided, then work with the Office of Health Integration on that. Um, so it's, it should be more than um, just a total number, but we're, you know, I don't have the um, expertise here in the room to go back and pull up those files and walk people through that. In addition, so the, um, let's see if I can find it. Right. Not well, now. The webinar that was held is available on the department's website. Under initiatives, Medicaid health homes, 
you see there under featured news is the webinar recording from that and then the PowerPoint that accompanied that and that's going to talk about uh, the de-identified data and the information that's there. At this point, I don't have any more questions that have been submitted in writing. We will um, work to get the PowerPoints from all the TAs up. We're not going to be posting the recordings to all of them. There might be a couple of them that we can get up there because for those of you that had difficulty sort of hearing, uh, because we, we had a lot of phone problems, the recording of it is even worse uh, than it probably was live. So apologize for that. That's why I've switched to doing these in my office. It, um, the feedback was that the audio is a lot better. Not sure today why the screen sometimes is changing to black, but I guess I'd say it's always something. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and end the, the webinar. If you want to sign up for the one next week, uh, there is uh, the link to it again on that slide that was sent out. And I hope everybody has a great week, and thank you for participating today. Goodbye.